thank you everyone for coming out today. Um, welcome to the Latham and Watkins Forum, uh, and thank you to the Reese Center on Law and Security uh, for sponsoring this event. I am Lisa Monaco. I am a distinguished senior fellow at the Reese Center on Law and Security uh, and a professor here at the law school. Uh, special welcome to some of my students that I see in the, uh, in the audience. Um, thanks for coming out for what I think is a really important uh, event and one that uh, NYU and the law school and the Reese Center is, is uniquely situated um, to host. Uh, I'm going to introduce our panelists in a second, and you will uh, be blown away, as I was, by the breadth of the experience and expertise that we've got on the stage this, uh, this afternoon. And notably, uh, that is really reflects interdisciplinary expertise, right? We've got lawyers, we've got doctors, we've got journalists. Um, so it's really an impressive array, and I think something that uh, NYU, the law school, the Reese Center, um, is really, uh, really proud to be able to bring to you. So without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our panelists. We're going to have a discussion this afternoon on the coronavirus, legal issues, policy issues, international uh, law and governance questions, um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. So let me begin by introducing our panelists. Um, I am going to um, start at the far end. We have uh, Lori Garrett, who is here with us. She's a former senior fellow at the Council for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations here in New York. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, science journalist, the best selling author of um, books very relevant to this discussion today, uh, The Coming Plague, Newly Emerging Diseases in a World Out of Balance. Uh, was, I think, her first book, if I'm right about that, Lori? Yes. Um, and Betrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health. Uh, I would note these titles, um, more than a 10 years old, maybe almost, um, but yet um, still incredibly relevant and on point and uh, obviously quite prescient. Um, uh, Lori has been at the forefront for years of um, some of the uh, most... Um, vexing global public health challenges and sounding the alarm on the danger of emerging infectious disease. She's been recognized in journalism, academia, and the public health community, and she's going to bring today, I think, a rare perspective as a science journalist, and as I said, somebody who's been on the front lines of very significant worldwide epidemics from SARS to MERS, Ebola, and HIV. Uh, next to Lori is Dr. Alexandra Phelan. Uh, she's a member of the Center for Global Health Science and Security and an instructor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Georgetown in Washington, D.C., and a professor in Global and Public Health Law and Ethics at Georgetown Law Center. Uh, we won't hold it against you that it's a different law school, Alexandra. Uh, Dr. Phelan works on legal and policy issues related to infectious diseases with a particular focus on emerging and re-emerging infectious disease outbreaks and international law. She, uh, as, I've, uh, as you could tell from her appointment, she's got degrees in both biomedical science and law and focuses on global governance of infectious diseases. Next to Dr. Phelan is Dr. Shitong Chow who is visiting us here uh, at the law school this semester from the University of Hong Kong, where he's an assistant professor of law uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he's an expert on property and urban law with a focus on comparative law in China. Dr. Chow um, graduated from Wuhan University, which will become very relevant in our discussion <laughs> this afternoon. Um, is also a graduate of Peking University and Yale University, uh, where he received an LLM. Again, not holding it against you. Um, <laughs> he has practiced in the courts in Wuhan uh, and clerked in the Hubei Province High People's Court. So uh, we, are, we are bringing you uh, a real on the ground perspective. Uh, and finally, uh, directly next to me, Dr. Howard Zucker. Dr. Zucker is the Commissioner of Health for the state of New York. That means he is the state's chief physician. 
He leads initiatives uh, in, uh, throughout the state to combat such important issues as the opioids crisis, to strengthen environmental health, and, and the AIDS epidemic uh, in New York. He um, has been many years at uh, the New York State Department of Health and has, has helped establish a network of hospitals equipped uh, to treat Ebola, uh, something that uh, we crossed paths on when I served um, as the President's Homeland Security Advisor during the Ebola um, uh, epidemic in 2014 and 2015, um, and has implemented uh, programs in New York to treat uh, the threat of Zika uh, and spearheaded uh, issues like combating antimicrobial resistance and measles. Um, he oversees the entire public health and healthcare workforce here uh, in public healthcare facilities in New York. He is a, uh, has received his MD from George Washington School of Medicine in DC, and uh, a JD and an LLM from two other New York <laughs> law schools, <coughs> Fordham, Columbia, uh, and has taught Washington. biosecurity law at Georgetown. I think note to the dean that we need to um, up our global public health <laughs> expertise here. Um, he has a public policy background as well as serving as a White House fellow uh, and uh, for then Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson. Uh, he rose to become a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Health in the Department of Health and Humor, Human uh, Services, overseeing the Medical Reserve Corps. Uh, that's today a Medical Reserve Corps that's run by the U.S. Surgeon General. Um, and he's worked in pandemic preparedness um, from SARS to anthrax. He's recognized internationally for his work to advance global uh, health, uh, including serving as an assistant director general at the World Health Organization. So we'll get into that experience as well. So um, I did not overstate the expertise that we are bringing you here this afternoon. Uh, I really want to thank um, all of the panelists for, for being here. So let's get right into it. Um, I want to start with a little bit of a kind of state of play, if I could, and I'm going to go uh, to Lori Garrett and to you, Dr. Zucker, on this. Um, we have all been kind of bombarded almost daily with the um, kind of running count and maps about the spread of the coronavirus. Um, let me start with you, Lori, and ask you just to give folks a level set, right? Um, what is the scale and scope, um, and how should we be thinking about it uh, today as we sit here? And then I'll go to you, Dr. Zucker, on what's the, what's the situation here in New York, and how should we be thinking about that? Thank you. For, I want to say two quick things before I answer your question. First of all, to the chair of our panel, thank you for your service in the Obama administration, for the tremendous pandemic preparedness infrastructure you created all of which the Trump administration destroyed in 2018. So we find ourselves without Lisa's masterful system of preparedness uh, infrastructure in place in America today as we face the possibility of uh, COVID-19 reaching our shores. Thank you, Thank you for everything much. you did. Thank and to, yeah. And I also see uh, quite a number of Asian students in the audience, and I want to say to all of you, I regret from the bottom of my heart whatever racial assaults you have heard or seen, any mistreatment you have undergone, it's unconscionable, there is no basis in it, and you, you deserve the support of everybody in this room and of all American citizens. Um, so to answer your question, unfortunately now I'm going to bash China. <laughs> um, and when I say the Chinese and China, I'm talking about Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party, and the leadership of the People's Republic of China. Um, we are in a very difficult situation as a global community right now for two chief reasons. One is that um, clearly the government of Xi Jinping has been lying about this epidemic from the very beginning, from the earliest stages in December, before anybody was outside of China was aware there was this new disease. But when physicians and uh, public health people in Wuhan knew there's a new pneumonia, 
There's something killing people. It's dangerous, it's terrible. Um, and as I documented in, in detail in a recent article in Foreign Policy, so I won't go through it, you can look it up if you want, but at every step of the way, since publicly finally acknowledging the existence of this epidemic, the Chinese government has created a narrative and said, this is the narrative of the moment, and then made the data fit the narrative. When that narrative failed, go to narrative number two and make the data fit narrative number two. That fails, go to narrative number three. What are these narratives? Oh, we have an outbreak, it's 100% about the fish market. Nobody's got it. There's no risk to anybody else. It's all in this fish market. There's no such thing as a coronavirus in fish. So we knew right away it wasn't a fish market. But you go from there and expand, and you realize from the very beginning, it traced already to early December, there were cases spreading utterly independent of the wild animal market. So there was already human-to-human -human transmission in Wuhan uh, that had nothing to do with that narrative. Then it was, we've shut the market down, so now the epidemic will magically stop. And we will now report, there's only 30 cases. There's only 32 cases. There's only, and for two weeks, the numbers never even hit 50. One day, they actually went backwards. Oh, we've made a mistake, it's fewer cases than we said yesterday. They were all lies. They were fabricated numbers, whole cloth. One of the things the lies conveniently did was create a perfect ratio of deaths to uh, supposed active confirmed cases so that you had a fatality rate that was exactly what they wanted, 2%. Uh, then when it was clear that there was fluorid spread well beyond the animal market, the first person who spoke up about it uh, was Li Wenliang, and his speaking up about it, of course, got him in deep trouble. You've all heard of him, the physician who has sadly died of uh, COVID-19. Uh, uh, Li Wenliang uh, actually just sent a chat message to a physician chat room. It wasn't on all of Weibo or something. It was, it was actually a fairly confined messaging. But um, because of it, he and seven other physicians were forced to come before the secret police, sign a statement saying, we are liars, we are rumor mongers, we made this up, it's not true. And he had said the key thing that brought the attention of the state down hard on him, he referred to it as being, quote, something like SARS. And of course, the SARS virus outbreak in 2003 was covered up by the Chinese government under Zhang Zemin in a transition to Hu Jintao and uh, had a dramatic impact on the status of China and how the outside world saw them. So I don't want to take up too much time going through everything that has happened since they finally publicly on New Year's Eve announced that there was this epidemic and then a series of steps thereafter. I just want to put a couple things on the table and then tell you where we are, I think, at this moment. Um, one is, we now know Jiang Zemin addressed uh, a top party officials on January 7th saying he was taking control of the epidemic. For the head of state of the largest nation in the world, the second biggest economy of the world, with a whole lot on its plate that has nothing to do with a new virus, to actually say, I am taking control of this, means he knew a lot was worse than what was publicly told. He knew this was a much more dire situation than on January 7th was a matter of public record. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, the, we have had two major episodes where suddenly the alleged count, the number of infected, the number of dead, has skyrocketed in one day. So you, you've had a baseline, 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 then pew, and then baseline, baseline, baseline. Pew. In both those occasions, they came the day after a major pronouncement from Xi Jinping. In one case, it was when he sent out a message through the party infrastructure saying, there shall be no more cover-up. Anybody who lies about this or, or obstructs the unfolding epidemic response will, will be shamed for eternity. Um, you know, in Communist Party jargon, that's pretty bad. Um, and so the next day, boom, all of a sudden, there's all these numbers reported. Now, that was January 1920. The second big one came more recently, uh, February 12th, when all of a sudden uh, it was announced that they were going to count the numbers differently in Wuhan and Hubei. Not anywhere else in China. They're still using the same old counting system. 
classifying cases the same old way, but in this one region, uh, the numbers will be counted differently, and that resulted in a huge jump, 14,000 plus cases reported additionally in one day. Since then, uh, the numbers have supposedly been slowing down. Uh, since then, the deaths have supposedly been slowing down. And it has been a matter of party um, rhetoric repeated many times over, over the last 10, 12 days, that the epidemic has reached its peak and it will uh, come down towards zero uh, sometime in March. Uh, and this is based on CDC data, some of which was first published only about 24 hours ago, maybe 28 hours ago. I, I lose track of time because I try to be on China time and America time at the <laughs> same time, and so you can imagine I'm not getting much sleep these days. Um, but uh, it, uh, and this was a big paper, the first big paper to come out of China CDC. There, that, there you have a Centers for Disease Control, as do we. Um, and this paper uh, looks at more than 70,000 cases uh, and concludes that indeed the new onset of infection rate has been going down. So that what we're allegedly seeing now, according to this study, is the catch-up time on incubation. Now the incubation period on this disease turns out to be very long. And one of the things we're finding as we look outside of China, things like the cruise ships, uh, where people are getting infected, and uh, some of the outbreaks in Singapore uh, and Hong Kong, is that this incubation time, which we were initially told and assured by Wuhan authorities was three days, uh, then we're, we were told and assured by CDC China was 14 days, we now know is out as far as 24, maybe 25 days. What this means is that if what we're doing is waiting for catch-up time on long incubating cases, but not new infections, uh, we can't be rest assured until the end of February. Um, now, do I believe any of this? Um, I was in the SARS epidemic in China throughout and in Hong Kong. And uh, in the two years following, I spent a lot of time investigating on the ground the SARS responses in Vietnam, in Singapore, in Thailand, and back in the mainland and in Hong Kong. So I, I have a really good idea of how the state, how Beijing responded to SARS. And from, by, by a, maybe January 5th or 6th, it was obvious to me that they had decided to use the SARS playbook uh, in responding to COVID-19. What was the SARS playbook? It was, oops, we screwed up, we covered up for too long, we allowed the virus to get all over the country. Um, we have no choice but to go to mass quarantines roadblocks, temperature and fever checks all over the whole nation. Um, you know, on any given day in Beijing, I would have my temperature taken 12 to 15 times every time you go in and out of a doorway of any building um, and pulled over by police to have it taken as you drive down the streets. Um, and, and then anyone with a fever, regardless of the cause of fever, because there was no test to confirm SARS, um, you would be quarantined, and they built those instant hospitals that we've had much ado about with the current outbreak, and you would be uh, stored away in an instant hospital until uh, you went two weeks without a fever. End of story, and it worked. But it worked for SARS because the infectious stage of SARS actually was coincident with fever stage. So they actually were capturing everybody who was potentially infectious. We now know with this virus, you can have no symptoms at all and be contagious to another person. So without a way to test who's infected and who's not, the quarantine policy is almost de definitely going to fail. Um, the second problem is that the screening test they have developed, which is, uh, for those of you science nerds in the group, is RT-PCR takes, a, you know, if you have an Illumina or a high throughput device to screen on, it's about a four hour test. Uh, if you lack the high speed, it's a little longer. But at any rate, you can get a one-day turnaround on yes, no, you're infected. Turns out to have a 50% false negative rate. Oops. <laughs> so then the third thing is a lot of people who really are symptomatic and in fact are in intensive care unit with pneumonia test negative. We don't know why, 
they certainly have plenty of virus in their body, but it comes up negative on the test. So the big change that recently was made was to add them in based on symptoms into the case count numbers. Um, bottom line, I think that they've, they've made a series of blunders, and I'm happy to dissect them further in the Q&A time if you're interested, um, that have absolutely both undercut the capacity to control the disease and also undercut all global and national trust. There's no reason if you're in Wuhan today for you to trust the Beijing government, or frankly, most of Wuhan authorities. Um, and in eroding the trust nationally, they've played the, the WHO, and I'm gonna let Howard talk about WHO, but they've <laughs> played WHO like a fiddle. And unfortunately, WHO is limited by the fact that it, by charter, has to deal with nation states, not with individuals, not with the masses within the state. So if the nation state chooses to lie, WHO transmits lies. Um, and so my bottom line is no, I don't trust any of the numbers. No, I don't believe that it's only 75,000 people infected to date. I think it's probably quite substantially more than that. Um, and uh, I'm deeply concerned that um, you, you basically now have about 100 million people in China who are not in their homes, jobs, and schools at the moment. They took, they left and fled. They have fled Wuhan, they have fled any place they thought there might be a quarantine. They took advantage of the lunar holiday to go to home villages and various parts and they've not returned. Most factories are still not operating or are operating at very low level. Most schools are still not open. And this is the whole nation I'm talking about. When these people are now under a lot of pressure from Xi Jinping to get the economy rolling again. China's hurting. This is very, very, very economically painful. So, um, so they want everybody to come back to school and, and factories, and I think we'll see a second a resurgence. So you put a lot on the table, uh, Lori, that I want to get into on the response front. I want to hear from, from Howard first on um, you know, the numbers issue, right? I mean, Lori kind of put on the table the the outline that we've seen in some of the reporting here has been um, 75,000 global infections, and, and Lori gave us some, some food for thought and how we should trust that number, and a, and a death toll within China only of about 2,000, uh, but obviously some cases in you know at least two dozen countries uh, external to China. So how should we think about that, and then what is the situation here in New York um, I, I think you, like me, feel that we, the first casualty in a crisis is, is reason and facts. So let's, let's get back to facts and perspective and, and, sure. uh, and hear uh, your view on both. Sure. So New York, as New York State with an international city, New York City, every time our antennas are usually up whenever we hear of something, whether it's an infectious disease or any of the problems that can occur on an international stage. Um, so when, when this happened, <clears throat> we were already thinking, how is this going to impact us, particularly with John F. Kennedy Airport uh, and the travel that we have? Uh, immediately, we spoke with the Port Authority, which is uh, run uh, by, uh, by the governor, um, and we sat down and had a conversation about flights coming in. Uh, at that time, there were about 15,000 flights that were coming into, uh, 15,000 people that were coming into, uh, into the United States, and many that came into JFK, along with SFO, San Francisco, and LAX, and elsewhere. Uh, those number of individuals now is down to about 800 to 12, uh, 800 to 1300 according to the CDC yesterday. So it's a dramatic drop. <clears throat> but for New York, what we've had so far is we've had uh, persons under you know, investigation looking at individuals where there's concern whether they had traveled uh, from uh, uh, Wuhan and they had fever or if there was an issue of concern and there were 25 people of that, um, uh, that fall into that category between the, both the city uh, at city as well as the rest of the state. And all of those tests have come back negative so far, or they have come back negative. So, so, so far we've had uh, zero individuals in, in the state of New York. We continue to monitor uh, those who come into the state uh, for who are from either the Wuhan uh, area or, um, uh, the, um, or elsewhere in, in, uh, in China. And we have about over 400 individuals outside of New York City, and there are thousands of individuals within, within the city that we have been, uh, uh, that, that have been monitored as a result of, um, of a concern uh, to be sure that there isn't any risk of infection. 
these are some of the challenges that, that we're obviously uh, uh, we're, we're faced with as we, uh, as we move forward with any of the um, uh, infectious diseases of this nature. And, and we are used to this uh, in the past. I would like to put it in some perspective because a lot of times people get very nervous and very anxious about things. And like I said, we haven't had a case here. But last week, we had probably in the, uh, well, well, I'll give you the, some, the final number for the entire season so far. We've had over 100,000 individuals in the state of New York who have had the flu. We've had, unfortunately, thousands of deaths, uh, and, we've had, um, and we've had, unfortunately, three pediatric deaths in the state uh, from flu. Uh, and in the country, there are millions of individuals who have had the flu uh, this season. So in the, and, and unfortunately, you know, thousands who have, have died, and if you look globally, even more so. So I think that it's important to keep things in some perspective when we're, we're dealing with these things, but to always remain vigilant and, and pushing forward on things. Um, Thanks, thanks for that, Howard, because I do think that that type of perspective is very, very important. I know uh, Governor Cuomo recently said that the common flu remains a far greater threat uh, right. to New Yorkers. Uh, and so it is, it's important to keep that in perspective, even as we delve further into uh, many of the very important issues that Lori put on the table and that we'll talk about um, uh, for the rest of the panel. Um, I want to kind of zoom out now and, and talk about the responses, right, both at from China, from the international public health community, uh, and then obviously here in the United States. And let's start, of course, with China. Um, Lori put some issues on the table for us, but um, as I mentioned at the outset, we are really fortunate to, to have somebody um, in uh, Professor Chow to, who has spent some time in Wuhan. Um, it's probably fair to say um, that many, many Americans had never heard of Wuhan before um, the coronavirus stories started to hit. Can you give us a little bit of a, a sense of, of the place? How should we think about uh, the city? Um, you know, for folks who are not familiar um, with, with that location um, and, you know, kind of the, anything you have heard or know to be the case with the kind of on-the-ground response there? Uh, sure. Uh, firstly, um, I have spent uh, four years in Wuhan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, did my undergraduate uh, study. And in the past months, I have been really talking to, uh, well, my parents uh, in Hubei, so about mm -hmm. uh, four hours away from Wuhan. Mm -hmm. And my two cousins uh, in Wuhan, one of them actually is working in a hospital. Uh, so, um, uh, what I'm seeing right now, I think I, uh, I actually admire Lori for many of the very insightful uh, comments. Uh, I think I agree with many uh, points you have made. Uh, I think the most important one, actually, we, we are going to be on the same page, is that I think uh, the current period, like what's going on right now, I think it could be a risk, a risk case period. Because the thing is that people have been in their house, for like about one month, you know, people are becoming impatient, mm -hmm. and the government has is under this pressure to getting people back to work. That's why I have been warning my parents uh, in the past month, in the past week, basically, you know, uh, you know, keep alert, don't go outside because mm -hmm. it's the time like people think, okay, uh, you know, maybe it's under control, right? Mm -hmm. People, are, people actually are indeed. I'm talking to people in Wuhan and also in other parts of Hubei. People are indeed becoming actually a bit more optimistic because the government, the government now is actually in action, right? So I think that's, that's something actually uh, I fully uh, agree with. But the second thing, because I have been uh, trying to understand what really happened, so mostly from an inside perspective, right? Uh, I would say we can really divide what happened in January uh, into two periods. Mm -hmm. So from like, uh, I would say like the end of December to January the 6th, I would say the local authorities didn't actually act that badly. Mm -hmm. Right. So actually, on December 30th and December 31st, uh, they already knew there was a big problem, and the physicians and the nurses got infected. Uh, they already actually, they are, I think, December 31st, there had already been like a, a gene test mm -hmm. by researchers. Mm -hmm. They know it was like 80 percent similar to SARS, and the local, the public health authority in Wuhan already reported to the national CDC uh, in Beijing on December 30th. Mm -hmm. And on December 31st, the national CDC already sent experts uh, to Wuhan, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And from January 1st to January 6th, 
the, the, the local public health authority in Wuhan, they already issued, well, internal documents about this thing. So basically warning the hospitals to take actions. And also they, they, are also, they had already started issuing public notice to the public. Well, we don't know whether the numbers are good or bad, but mm -hmm. they already started issuing mm -hmm. notice. So that's to say it's not that bad. And also on January the 3rd, the, the, the Chinese government already started sharing information with the United States, with the WHO, and also with like Hong Kong government and you know, among other governments. So that's why the Hong Kong government, actually on January the 4th, has already initiated a so-called second class emergency uh, response, right? So I would say from like the end of December to January 6th, it was okay. I don't think it's like perfect. But what was missing here are the two weeks you have said, right? From January the 6th, to January 18th, yeah. that was the two meetings of the Wuhan city government mm -hmm. and the Hubei city government, uh, the Hubei provincial government. That was like the most important public or political event, right, of the provincial and the city governments. And it, 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 it looks like somebody, you know, suddenly pressed the pause button, right? Mm -hmm. Everything stopped, mm -hmm. and the Wuhan public health authority stopped publicizing any information. But well, when they did this, they said that there was no new cases. Yeah. So I think those were the two weeks we have really missed. Hmm. So uh, from my perspective, I mean, I think there are two problems from an inside perspective. One is really the flow of information, okay? The other is the principal agent problem. That to say, according to a recent report published by President Xi Jinping, right, it's official, right, he already gave instructions on January the 7th, right? right? But then, then why did the local government wait until January the 20th to take serious, serious actions? So for me, because one of my expertise, yeah. in addition to property law, yeah. which had nothing to do with this event, yeah. it's actually a local government law. Right. So right. that I have always been interested in understanding the incentives, right? The, 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 the behavioral patterns of local governments and how they interact with the central government. I think that's the key here. That to say, when the local governments don't have much authority or autonomy, have to basically get everything done by sending the information to Beijing yeah. and waiting for the commands, the orders from Beijing. <laughs> that's like the big waste of time. I think that's something inherent in the institution. That's something we need to keep in mind, at least in the future, for responding to such a public health uh, crisis. So that's, I guess, I'm using up my time. No, no, no. But, yeah. Can you give us, I want to stay with you for a second and then also go to Dr. Phelan on this. Give the audience a sense, is there a legal framework that is being um, conducted here or that's being operated under? Is it mm -hmm. extra legal? How, how should we think about um, these levels and how they're working? Sure, I think there are, there are two things. Uh, the first is at a legal level, as, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Alexandra uh, Finan uh, will say, right? We have uh, uh, at least two laws. One is the law of emergency, or the law of emergent uh, incidents, right? That's one law. The other is the law of uh, infectious disease. So these two, law, two laws actually, uh, there are like many articles, but they actually define, for example, uh, you know, at what situations, you know, you have the obligation to report to the provincial and also the central government, and who has the obligation and the responsibility to disclose the information to the public, and, and what conditions you can initiate the emergency, uh, the emergency responses. So that's the law, which I think are very important, and there are also problems with such laws. Uh, the other part is the political part, or the de facto part, is really about the relationship between the central government and the local government. Because as many of our experts here, like Professor Jerry Cohen knows, uh, one of the, the secrets to China's, I would say, relative success in the past, from like 1978 to 2008, the economic success is a so-called de facto federalism. That to say the central government gave the certain degree of autonomy in managing its, its economy, in managing the urban affairs. Right? So local officials, they are also motivated to a certain degree to, 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 you know, to do their job as good as you know, they can. But that kind of uh, de facto federalism or decentralization has been somehow reversed in the past decade because of this, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, effort from the central to, to centralize power. 
I mean, there is a rationale for centralization. I can give you a one day lecture about that. But, <laughs> but this centralization does have the problem of what I've been talking about, the information flow, right? Everything goes, goes to Beijing. As you can understand, it's going to be very difficult to govern New York City or New York State from DC, right? It's just going to be much more time consuming. <laughs> and you won't do that, right? Never. For the, right? For the record, <laughs> Dr. Zucker did not comment on that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the second thing is that, well, assuming President Xi Jinping had given instructions on January the 7th, right? Assuming the instructions are serious enough, and clearly there's a principal agent problem, the local officials clearly didn't take his instructions seriously enough, right? Otherwise, the problem could have been solved. And instead, the local officials, they are very busy with their most important annual events, yeah. the two meetings, yeah. right? So I, I will just conclude with a larger word, right? The, the local officials, they are struggling with, I mean, there are three things right now, right? Well, many of them have been fired. Yeah, many of them <laughs> have been fired, but there are three things. Uh, the first one is development, economic development, mm -hmm. right? The second thing is social stability, yeah. and the third thing is loyalty. That's what I call development, stability, and loyalty. It's a very tricky balance uh, to, to, ma to maintain. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the past decade, almost decade, centralization, I think, may have made this had made local officials' job even more difficult. And uh, what I would say, really last thing, um, if you talk to officials in Wuhan, even the two, I mean the party secretary of Wuhan who had been removed and also governor of Hubei who had been removed, they would really feel very just, it's just bad luck. Hmm. They, they, as you have said, it's a typical playbook. They did nothing unusual, yeah. right? But again, I think it's an institutional problem we should really reflect upon. So, Dr. Phelan, let me get you in here. I mean, we've, we've heard and we've seen reporting about uh, the restrictions that have been put in place. Laurie talked about her own experience uh, through SARS. We had a report in the New York Times yesterday, I think it was, about at least the half of the um, Chinese population under some form of restrictions. Uh, we've got reporting of the annual meeting of the National People's Congress that may be delayed. This is a huge, huge event. Um, what's your perspective on these measures and the, a number of the issues that Lori put on the table um, and the, the framework that uh, Dr. Chiao has, has, put on the, has put on the table as well? Yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. I think um, I agree very much with a lot of the points that Dr. Chow uh, made, in particular with regards to the relationship of information sharing and the structural impediments of a bureaucracy. So rather than necessarily active conspiracy, there is also just simply the, the structural impediments of a very slow-moving democracy of, and how that, that flows. And I think there are some interesting parallels that when we do talk about the United States yeah. legal system, um, I like the term de facto federalism mm -hmm. that you use because I think for the law students and the lawyers in the room, there's a lot of interesting issues about who has a duty to act for public health, who has the authority under law to act for public health, and what are the limitations on the exercise of that authority that parallel quite nicely between the US federal system and this de facto federalism or centralization that we see in the Chinese scenario. So if we're looking now at the, the limitations, that last question, which goes to the, to the question asked about the way in which quarantines and control, uh, control measures have been implemented in China. Um, you know, I think uh, there has been what I consider relatively unfortunate praise for some of the mechanisms and measures that have been taken in China. Um, but I think the, the starting point is that public health powers are there to protect the public health and they really derive from police powers in, in, all, in governments all around the world. These are quite, can be quite coercive powers and, you know, these are powers that in, in effect constrain individuals' liberties on balance for the protection of the public's health. Now, the right to health is a, is a human right, and so is, say, the right to movement and the right to life and these individual liberties, and we are in this process of always balancing these rights and ensuring that they are protected. So uh, a cordon sanitaire, which is, exactly, which is exactly what we saw in Wuhan, it wasn't a quarantine. Um, what it was was essentially uh, cordoning off an entire city so that people couldn't come in and out, is a fairly arbitrary 
um, and highly restrictive and constrictive measure that isn't appropriately tailored to achieve a public health outcome, right? Because what it's actually doing is not assessing the risk to individuals or the risk to spread. It's essentially trying to track and contain something in one place at, the, at essentially the sacrifice of all the individuals who are in that area. Um, that is not only morally reprehensible, but there are also legitimate issues of whether that actually is not just good for public health of the people in Wuhan, the public health of people in China, but public health of people around the world. Because what we have seen, and particularly the international response to these measures, is a shifting of norms. Some really important norms about what we, ex what we think is a necessary uh, intervention for public health. So I'm just going to say why this is actually quite bad for public health beyond just the, the, the very real human rights issues that, that emerge from these sorts of responses. Public health is reliant upon public trust. When a government engages in measures that cause fear or uncertainty and aren't appropriately tailored and do restrict liberties, you undermine public trust. And public health needs uh, people feel, feeling comfortable to go to doctors, go to healthcare centres, engage with officials and tell them about their travel history or potential symptoms so that you can then accurately screen them, um, uh, test them and isolate them if they're unwell and actually provide them with treatment. You know, that is what a good public health response looks like, right? When you put people in a position where they feel that they're going to be locked up, that they're not going to have access to food or water, or they're going to lose their job, or they're not going to see their family, um, they, it's indefinite. And perhaps they won't have access to vitally needed uh, medications. Um, you know, that's when you see people starting to avoid public health authorities. And what that means is that's when you get transmission in the community, because people are sick and, and they're avoiding authorities and they're actually coming into contact with other individuals. So public health. Uh, tries to avoid these measures. And so one of the, the core sort of tenets that we have and a, a test that is reflected in international law under the international health regulations, which are our leading law for in, international infectious disease, also within the US constitution in the way it's interpreted in terms of limitations under, uh, under looking at the, the Fifth, uh, Fifth Amendment and also the 14th Amendment and how they apply to quarantines here in the United States. Um, and around the world, uh, under international human rights law, is the least restrictive measure necessary to achieve a public health outcome. Mass quarantines are always highly restrictive. They are not the least restrictive measure needed to obtain the public health outcome and come with a range of consequences. I'll just leave one last sort of statistic on, on this particular point. Um, UNAIDS, Executive Director of UNAIDS today has come out and made clear that um, there are a significant number of individuals in China who are HIV positive who do not have access to their medications or are at risk of running out of their HIV medications. That is just one small example of the logistical impacts and the supply chain impacts and the human rights impacts, the human rights health impacts that uh, overly burdensome measures can have. Um, and there are going to be thousands of those sorts of examples of other chronic diseases, people with, uh, who are going to be dying of secondary reasons as a result of these, these purported public health, but really authoritarian measures. Uh, let me ask you, thank you very much for that, and also for planting what I suspect are some good uh, fodder for a law school note or two um, from your, your lay down there. Um, Dr. Zucker, let me go to you on this last point that Dr. Phelan has made in terms of uh, the role of the international community, the UN aid uh, uh, reference that she made. Uh, as we said at the outset, you are a former official from the World Health Organization. You just give um, you know, a short description of what that is, what its role is, uh, and the controversy we've, we've had with regard to the coronavirus in terms of their pronouncement uh, about a public health uh, emergency? So, I, I mean, the WHO is an interesting organization. I will start by saying, as a, I'll start by saying there, are, there are many very talented individuals over there. Mike Ryan, who's running these operations, is a really talented individual working hard. But it's also, it's, uh, it's, in its own way, it's a political organization as well. And as Laurie mentioned, it, it's, uh, the, it's made up of member states, and the way it operates is in a, in a system which I think uh, in a lot of ways needs to be uh, updated and, and changed. We move at a much faster pace today than, than the, the way the structure is set up. And um, it's, the power that it has is limited in, in many ways. It, it, it runs the international health regulations. There's a handful of things that the WHO can actually do and, and to push forward. The 
biggest uh, strength it has is its convening power and its pressure to put other, to make nations sort of do certain things because uh, uh, they will in some ways be shamed if they don't. And, and so I think that uh, that um, comes to play in, in many ways. But there is a lot of uh, pressure put upon them. It is uh, an organization, as Laurie said, that, that um, in some ways uh, uh, has the pressure of politics that, that comes into play. So um, if they issue a public health emergency international concern, there are some implications that, that come from that. There's also money that, you know, in a lot of ways, money will go out to some countries uh, for support if there's an emergency. Uh, but in a lot of ways, the, the strength it has is its, its convening power and its ability to sort of in some ways make people realize that if the WHO said this is a problem, uh, then the rest of the world is going to turn around and say, well, why are you not acting responsibly when that happens? So they um, came under a lot of criticism in, during the Ebola uh, sure. epidemic um, for waiting months right. uh, for declaring a public health emergency of international concern. Uh, here, there were signs that they were um, moving slowly, not as slowly. What, what's your perspective on that? So I, I agree, and, and so then the question is why? You know, what, what happened? Is this, um, you know, I'm not there, and, and so all I can think of is like sort of, I'm sure there was much, uh, uh, quite a debate going on about when to issue something of this nature. Is this something which is of concern? And again, it goes back a little bit, as we were talking about before this uh, meeting convened, about risk. And, and it's not just risk, individual risk, but sometimes uh, you know, those who are in uh, positions of authority may look at it this, uh, as how they will weigh risk. And sometimes there are other, influencing, uh, there are other factors that may influence that decision. So I can't, I can't speak uh, necessarily to exactly what happened in that room as those discussions were taking place. But you know, uh, Laurie actually, I think, was listening to that. You know, so, so I, I wasn't listening to the debate, but I'm sure it was a challenging discussion. Oh my God! <laughs> uh, I think you know, if if anybody's looking for a subject to write, you know, a legal brief on, <laughs> if Alex doesn't beat you to it, mm -hmm. is um, we we have a problem. We set up a system in 1948 that we call the World Health Organization. We set up the international health regulations uh, in 2005 that were meant to sort of modernize the legal framework of WHO specifically for outbreaks, epidemics, et cetera. Um, and ultimately, it's about a, a bunch of incredibly overpaid people in Geneva <laughs> with tax-free tax -free incomes um, <laughs> making decisions thinking about poor countries. And along comes the two biggest, you know, mega outbreaks of our time, actually the three biggest of our modern period since the passage of the um, international health regulations have occurred in the United States and China. And so the two wealthiest economies on the planet, the two most arguably most powerful nations on the planet, um, one was 2009 H1N1, in case you're scratching your head saying America, <laughs> and the other two were SARS in 2003, uh, the various bird flu outbreaks since, and now COVID-19 in China. And WHO shows deference to the big and powerful and acts quite differently to the countries that are uh, less powerful, less economically advantaged. Um, and it, it, what was going on in the conversation in the FIKE decision process mm. boiled down to this. Um, uh, I, Dr. Tedros, Director General WHO, have met with Xi Jinping. He's an honorable man. Mm. And he is very deeply concerned about this problem. And they are taking radical measures all over the nation. And they are doing the right thing, and they will bring this under control. And we must show solidarity and support to the Chinese people and government. And meanwhile, um, what we're going to all fall back on as our uh, uh, way to wiggle out of this one, why aren't we declaring an emergency, is we'll wait until we see secondary transmission outside of China in another place where people are getting it independently from China. Mm -hmm. So then you have the cruise ships. <laughs> And it's like, uh-oh, 
we better get moving. And then you have secondary transmission in Hong Kong and secondary transmission in Singapore, and it starts to be so. Uh, so the a pressure crazy. became too too, too great. great. To kind too of great, on. and they just finally had to do it. Yeah. I, if I may, I wanted to make a couple quick comments off of the very smart things that some folks here said. Let's do that quickly because then I want to get to the U.S. response because I have to imagine people are going to have views on that. Well, I f yeah. first of all, yeah. anything I say about China, you know, I have to show deference to the political genius on all matters, China, sitting right here in the front row. <laughs> so, Jerry, I apologize for my ignorance. Um, <laughs> but I, I, it, there is no event more important in China for the leader than a well-greased, well-oiled National People's Party Congress. It must function perfectly. Everybody must ratify, blah, blah, blah. And if you've never seen pictures of it, just Google, you'll see. I mean, it's, you know, 10,000 people in all in neat little rows with the giant star of the nation. Well, imagine now, take a Google picture, and now imagine everybody's wearing a mask. Oops. That's not going to work out. So there's a tremendous amount of pressure to bring this under control before late March and, and the Congress. And there's already talk about having to... Uh, postpone the yeah, Congress or, or yeah. cancel it. Yeah. And, and so this is a really serious. What I think um, we are seeing now unfolding that, has, that goes to what you were talking about with trust is um, this epidemic has been securitized. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who have disappeared supposedly to quarantine have been journalists, Chinese journalists, have been people who've posted uh, uh, videos on Weibo that show uh, brutal arrests, not by people in PPEs, but taking advantage of the epidemic, beating the crap out of people on the streets. Some of you may have seen people rounded up in downtown Beijing and stuffed into little tin boxes, and you hear them screaming bloody murder from these boxes, and nobody's wearing masks and so on, so this is not the quarantine. It's, they're using quarantine response to round up dissidents. We've even seen videos of lines of men cowering, covering their heads, and police going down and beating them with steel batons, commanding them to sing the national anthem before they go to quarantine. Um, and so I think that, that uh, if anything, you've been kind to them. This is... <laughs> At one point, the uh, bureau chief for uh, the New York Times in uh, Beijing, uh, when, when it was announced that Li Wenliang had died, there was an unparalleled outpouring of grief and rage on all Chinese social media. Usually people know you can't express these things. You'll get in big trouble, right? But people were so overwhelmed. And it poured out, and in real time, the New York Times was monitoring accounts being pulled. And you could see them right in front of you getting censored and the individual's account permanently blocked. And it was, un it was the, uh, the, re the way the state responded to the death of Li Wenliang. Everybody who goes to see Li Wenliang's small memorial in front of the hotel is being photographed. Every, all their identity and history is being noted. You know, if you dare to show honor to this hero of the epidemic, when um, Zhang uh, Nanshan, who was the uh, sort of hero of the SARS epidemic, and that he was the first physician in Guangzhou to identify there's a new disease in my hospital and to speak up about it, he sort of has been brought out of retirement as a new figure in this epidemic. And uh, he broke down in tears, sobbing on camera talking about the death of Li Wenliang. And this, I think, you know, for anybody in China to see this was just a huge political event. Um, I, you know, until the journalists that have been dragged off, we've been told they went to quarantine, are I heard from again. We have to assume that um, what has effectively happened, and I would love to hear your comments on this, but that what has effectively happened is that the ongoing security state has now thoroughly integrated with the securitized epidemic response. And both are being used for political purposes. Um, and I would just remind you that in November, the Chinese government started a national campaign that involved these posters that looked like um, Marvel comic superhero drawings. And they depicted 
a, like a bad guy in a Marvel comic wearing a mask. And the poster said, be a patriot, never wear a mask, exclamation point. Yeah. And the reason? Because they've developed the world's largest artificial intelligence facial recognition security state. And if you're wearing your mask, the AI can't pick up who you are and therefore monitor all your movements. So, you know, don't wear a mask. Now, six weeks after they launched that campaign, they have to make it a law to not wear a mask. Yeah. And you are seeing people rounded up on the streets for failure to wear a mask. So it's a, it's a really, it's a ver very vivid image, and I've seen some of that also in, on, in some of the news reporting. We've talked a lot about the Chinese measures. Of course, the Chinese aren't the only ones who um, have had a quarantine. I I'd love to hear from you, Dr. Phelan, on um, some of the steps that in this country we've taken. Um, uh, folks, I know we've been riveted by the cruise ship story, but a few weeks ago, the first, uh, I think I'm correct on this, but, um, but Dr. Zucker will correct me, the first um, uh, really large-scale quarantine since the flu, since the 1918 flu um, uh, pandemic was done right here in the United States in California. Have I gotten that right, uh, Dr. Zucker? It's the first time, yes. Yep. So, I mean, Dr. Phelan, f f the issues you brought up about public health and trust, give us your perspective on some of those steps, and then I'd love to hear also from you, Dr. Zucker, on, you know, you have to advise the governor, um, how, do, how does one think about these issues? The, the steps here in the United States? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, public health powers um, are rather broad. They need to be. They need to be flexible to be able to adjust to um, emerging infectious diseases or health threats that we may not, uh, may not be aware of. Um, and this, this point about the largest federal quarantine since, you know, the Spanish flu is important because most of the time public health powers are exercised by the states or delegated from the state down to local authorities such as here in New York City. Um, and the reason being is that states have their police powers reserved under the 10th Amendment of the Constitution, and the federal powers for public health are rather specific. So they are defined by the limits of the Commerce Clause. So where an infectious disease essentially can impact international, interstate trade or commerce or uh, from a foreign, uh, from sort of outside of the country into the United States. And so as a result, the CDC's powers under the Public Health Service Act are really narrowly defined for when there is that risk of state spread or spread from outside the country into the country. Um, the CDC's rules for how they respond to infectious disease outbreaks like this outbreak uh, were revised in 2017. There is some really interesting political timing. Um, it was all around inauguration. And for many, many years, the CDC has been trying to update these laws in response to the revision of the international health regulations, that is, those international laws. And under the rule, the CDC uh, can essentially... Um, uh, isolate or quarantine or treat someone who they reasonably, reasonably believe has been infected by a specified communicable disease. And those specified communicable diseases have to be in an executive order. Um, interestingly, there hasn't been an executive order for uh, the coronavirus, um, and the reason is probably uh, because it's likely captured by the definition of SARS, so a severe acute respiratory syndrome, you know, broadly. And what that means is that the CDC can impose quarantines and treatments and measures. Uh, and we have seen uh, these federal quarantines, which are rather unique and new to see federal quarantines of individuals who are coming, who have travelled in the last 14 days to Hubei province, who are US citizens, residents, um, or you know, don't uh, fall within the range of exceptions that uh, were set out by the federal government, um, and can be put in, in, in these quarantines. Um, I don't believe those are necessarily uh, appropriately tailored measures. There have been numerous people coming into the country, um, subject to previous CDC guidance, who were able to engage in home quarantine and self-monitoring and much less restrictive measures uh, well before these other quarantines were imposed. And there are a lot of challenges with implementing these sorts of measures in terms of actually getting accurate travel histories, people travelling on different passports, um, you know, because people can be dual citizens. So, you know, these seem 
to be a little bit more theatre and a bit more and, and more restrictive than necessary. I think um, when we look at something like uh, a reasonable belief of someone being infected from a um, from a, a Supreme Court precedent point of view, uh, point of view, really, you know, we require the Supreme Court has said that we need clear and convincing evidence if you are going to be compulsory confining someone, and that is a much higher standard than reasonable belief. Um, we haven't seen that necessarily tested uh, in this sort of outbreak, um, and you know what that would mean with the current <coughs> Supreme Court, um, because you know we, we look at how the say the different travel bans have been interpreted by the Supreme Court. Um, and whether we would see a similar division along those lines based on the government having a, you know, a, a re relatively legitimate interest in protecting public health, even if these measures do not appear to be appropriately tailored for that aim. So, Dr. Zucker, I want to leave a few minutes for questions, but um, obviously we're nowhere near needing any kind of quarantine. Right. Let's be very, very clear about that. But just as, as somebody who advises the governor um, and who would be the one uh, to be making these calls, how do you think about it? Sure, so first I always just say for the law students in the audience, you, you always wonder in class how Gibbons v. Ogden from the early 1800s and Jacobson oh, wow. versus that, Massachusetts, that right? In the early 1900s, these things that we studied in law school and say, is this ever gonna be relevant? Yeah, it actually <laughs> is. It, they, they do come back to, to, to uh, surface in, in life. So the, I, um, the way we, you know, when you make these decisions, you really do have to sort of weigh the public health and the public safety issues. These are, these are tough decisions to make, and we're, the best thing we can do is always to continue to monitor. You don't want to overreact to a situation, as I just mentioned about flu, and as the governor has spoken about, you know, uh, uh, constantly about the risk of flu and, and, and uh, versus the, the risk of coronavirus. But the best way to do this is just to keep a very close eye on everything that's going on any case that, uh, any person, we'll say a case because we haven't had a case, but any person that you're concerned about, you monitor, you try to track, you try to figure out what, what is going on, uh, keep a close eye. And we've had, uh, and this is very labor intensive, and human resources I should say, intensive, is any time there's someone of concern, you really do have to go back and try to figure out all the epidemiology that's involved here uh, and to move forward. I will draw from the example of the measles outbreak because that is a great example where, and this was only within the past year, we just finished uh, uh, dealing with this in, in October, and we had, um, uh, a real challenge there. We were working with the community and how far and how much can you push and what do you need to do and, and what can you do to make sure kids uh, who are uh, at risk or potentially affected are not in school. And, and so this is where you decide, okay, how much, uh, what do you need to do and, and to make sure uh, that the public remains safe. And, and uh, it is a balancing act. And I, I can't give a specific answer because every case is a little bit different. That was one scenario. Uh, this is another scenario. Uh, and so you need to keep it in perspective. And, and also it is dependent upon different regions. I mean, it's a little bit uh, different issue. For example, the measles issue was, was specific to a certain number of counties, but it could have spread. It could have spread more. Fortunately, the state has a very high immunization rate, except for these small pockets. But uh, we, you, the way you advise uh, anyone, you know, a governor or others, uh, is to sort of be sure that you're remaining very vigilant on top of the issue on a regular basis. Great. We've got a minute or two for questions. I know we have a hard stop at two because people have to go to class. Um, Professor Cohn, let's get there you up. A yeah, there's a mic coming to you. This is a great panel, and I congratulate the organizers and participants. Thank you. Uh, let's talk in conclusion about what are the implications of this experience for governance of China? Mm -hmm. Because however important these medical problems are, they will pass. Yeah. But the Chinese government, the Communist Party of China, Xi Jinping, is going to remain. So what I want to know from our extremely good speakers is what do you see about the implications of this? Is there likely as a result of this experience to be more freedom of speech in China, <laughs> less government manipulation of the media? Uh, would you uh, have greater freedom of information in China? Uh, it, are we likely to have more civil society NGO rules than have been allowed uh, so far? Uh, will the police be less arbitrary and coercive as a result of their highly publicized uh, depredations? 
Uh, what are we likely to see uh, with respect to federalism, centralization, more centralism or less? So I'm going to ask our panelists to give, and I'm going to, I'm going to use the power of the chair. I'm going to be positively President Xi-like here. Okay. <laughs> um, and say lightning round, uh, more open, less open. Uh, it's already less open. They're going to crack down like crazy. Um, and, uh, they, and you will note in all Chinese data, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau are listed as Chinese mainland data. Dr. Phelan? Um, so I've lived in China on and off over the last 20 years. And a phrase I've said since the beginning of this outbreak is that 2003 is not 2020. Mm -hmm. SARS is not what we're going to see now. 2016 is not 2020. The open China, the positive uh, ideas about China that we had four or five years ago before Xi Jinping came into power is not what we're going to see now. I think the changes that will enable Xi Jinping to endure this occurred in the last three years, particularly mm -hmm. civil society, information sharing. Uh, I think that it's more likely to get more. Uh, this, I don't think this will uh, rock him in the way that some people have, have thought it would. Dr. Chiang. I think um, we have to take a long-term perspective. I think in the long run, we have to believe in the power of the society and the power of the people. And the government, whatever it is, has to live with a more you know, uh, mobilize a more powerful society and the people to govern. Um, Dr. Zucker, you're happy to, uh, I'm happy to have you weigh in on this or for you to give a public health announcement for everyone to get the flu vaccine. I would give the public health announcement that everyone should get the flu vaccine because even though the numbers, you know, this is, everyone thinks, well, it's just February, you still should get your flu vaccine. Our numbers still go up. Last week was our second highest number of flu cases. Um, that we've had in, in decades, you know, per week, for, for a one week period. So. I think that type of perspective is a very good note to end on. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists.